Venerable Nalio actually to share a little bit from the perspective of early Buddhism and in terms of what can we say about how the Buddha meditated? Well, I very much appreciate us getting into the topic of meditation, but if you give me that question, I have to do a very short academic detour to just set the situation. Uh, we do not know for certain what the historical Buddha said and did. We only have textual reports from later times. And the area in which I'm working, early Buddhism, the early discourses extant in Pali, Sanskrit, Gandhi, Chinese, and Tibetan, only allow us to reconstruct what people thought the Buddha did and taught and practiced about two centuries after his life. So any kind of statement I might make about the Buddha is a conjecture. Is a fairly high probability that these textual sources, which I just have there standing behind me, are leading us fairly close to the historical Buddha, certainly closer than other later traditions. But we can only talk in terms of probabilities where we can be certain as what the Buddha did not teach. So what the Buddha did as a meditator, I mean, there's two, two things come to my mind. One would be the meditation leading to his awakening, but perhaps more interesting would be the smaller discourse on emptiness because that really ties in with the trajectory I hope we will be taking in this discussion. So which of the two would you like me to take up, Daniel? Let's start with the first, because I think we're going to definitely go deep in the second as well later. Okay, so the account of the Buddha's awakening, where we have like a range of sources, and so we are pretty sure that this is relatively close to what historically happened is that he had uh, earlier practiced these immaterial spheres, not found them to lead him to awakening, then he's done these ascetic practices found they also did not lead him to awakening. And on the night of his awakening, he practiced the four absorptions. Then he recollected his past lives. Then he developed the divine eye, which is seeing the passing away and re-arising of other living beings. And then he realized nirvana, the destruction of the defilements. That is just putting it very much into a nutshell. Very nice. And, and I think um, maybe we'll, get a little taste of the emptiness meditation as well. And then we can ask Rinpoche to um, sort of compare from his tradition. Yeah, that is actually, I think, the more interesting perspective. This is the shorter discourse on emptiness. And the Buddha starts off saying, I often abide in emptiness. Ananda has remembered that and asked him exactly, how did you do that? And then the Buddha describes in this discourse a gradual procedure of giving attention to emptiness in the form of absence. And it relates very much, I think it relates very much with the type of Mahamudra Dzogchen, Chan tradition kind of practice. He takes it from the actual situation they were living in. And I don't want to go into that, but then he takes up space, consciousness, nothingness, and signlessness. And these are four stages of practice, which is also how I practice emptiness and how I teach it, where we learn to gradually reduce the way we normally perceive the world, deconstruct, debunk the way we perceive the world. Boundless space has this understanding that everything material is ultimately empty. Boundless consciousness has the understanding that everything we experience in our mind is constructed by the mind. Nothingness, there's nothing, particularly no self. And then signlessness, which I think in later tradition is particularly more clearly understood under the idea of amanasikara, non-attention. Coming to a state of mind where you're not attending to anything, where the mind is not constructing, not fabricating, not making anything, but it's just there and completely letting go. And it's based on this refined uh, state of uh, sinusness or amanasikara, non-attention, then, then the breakthrough to liberation can take place. 